everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm Casey Bryant, and this is the Hat City Hockey Show. You know what I did last night? I got home from work, popped on the TV, and watched some NHL hockey. Now, that may not seem like a very important night in the grand scheme of things, but it was a relief. Surreal, yes, but man, did it feel good to see that sport on TV again. Welcome home, beautiful. Even though it is still shaping up to be a supremely weird year, the NHL is still giving us two outdoor games this season to be played at Lake Tahoe in State Line, Nevada. It's going to be a really unique spot with a picturesque backdrop, but the name was causing some confusion for Colorado's Pierre-Edouard Belmaire. Like, I have never uh, skated on a lake my entire life. We're not like, skating on a lake, though. Huh? It's not on a lake. It's not on a lake? No, it's beside lake. No! Yeah. I thought it was on Lake Tahoe. We're playing on 18th uh, fairway, bro. No. Take, I didn't even know. You take it. You take For it. real? Oh, you just crushed my dreams. <laughs> oh. Oh, poor guy. It's like he just found out that there's no Santa Claus. Like he's bragging to his friend about the list he sent to the North Pole and the cookies he's going to bake for him. And Andre Burakovsky comes in and is like, he's not coming down the chimney, bro. No. Oh, you just crushed my dreams. I want that reaction playing everywhere I go. What an absolute mood. Before we get going here, we want to give a quick shout out to our featured charity of the week, the Southern Connecticut Storm. They're a hockey team based out of New Canaan for developmentally disabled children. New York Rangers forward Chris Kreider skated with them this winter. It's a super great program. Head to ctstormhockey.org to find out how you can donate or volunteer your time today. We have a fantastic show for you here with a very potomac -y feel to it. Washington Capitals broadcaster Joe Beninati joins us in a moment, but first, I had the chance to sit down with the Hat Tricks resident Maryland native and Caps fan. Take a look. I am very excited for my first guest here on the Hat City Hockey Show because for the first time since we started doing this, I have a friend with me here in person. He's entering his third season in the FPHL, his second with the Danbury Hattricks. Please welcome number nine, Gordy Bennell. Gordy, how you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on today. Ah, oh, it's a pleasure. We're so happy to have you here in the building. It must feel good to get your sea legs under you again. Oh my gosh, it is, man. It's been a while since we've been been back here, and you know, it feels like we just left. You know, <laughs> it's, it's reoccurring. You know, and, and we're all happy to be back. I mean, couldn't be any more excited for this the season that we want to have. It was a long, long layover for you guys what have you been doing to keep yourself sane what have you been reading watching listening to that's kind of kept you occupied I've mostly I've been trying to keep in touch with all the guys from the team last year I mean we were such a great group last year and we all kept in touch throughout the you know our off season extended off season however you want to say it but the main thing was we, we try to remain a family and if anyone was ever down you know someone was right there to pick him back up hey hockey's right around the corner it's gonna be here it's coming it's coming so other than that personally I mean been getting on the ice as much as I could. You know, it's tough in Maryland. It's been, COVID's been bad there. But other than that, you know, just keeping in touch and keeping fans, friends and family close with me. Now, I know you're a Maryland guy. I'm, you're an outdoor sports guy, too. Have you been snowboarding? Yes. Is it? Yeah, I actually just went a couple weeks ago with my family. You know, a little getaway, but it was much needed. Are you good? I would hope that you're yeah, good at that I'd, so you don't hurt yourself. I'd say so. Yeah, I'd say so. It was definitely a fun time. <laughs> that certainly makes it more enjoyable anyway, yeah. not oh, yeah. having to worry about death. Or the pain or anything that comes along with the racks. <laughs> <laughs> well, in your hockey career, you've been a globetrotter, right? You have been all over the place throughout your career. You've played in Sweden, in the Czech Republic, in Mentor, Ohio, in the FBHL, and here in Danbury. Outside of Danbury, the obvious choice, yeah. what has been your favorite spot to spend a season? Not necessarily play, but to be in. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, personally, I'd probably go with uh, Sweden. Just the culture there is just an amazing, amazing place. The people are literally, you could, you could just go out by yourself and, you know, you spark conversation with anybody. And you could talk for an hour. You know, I just met this person. And, you know, that was the main thing for why I played there for a couple years. It was so easy for me to, you know, go into a brand new team. And everyone that came in was like, hey, hey. How you doing? You know, it was just so easy for me to step into the picture. Did you ever pick up any of the native language there? I mean, over the couple of years, yes, I did. But it took a lot of practice, and it kind of already went away. So <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, the next question was going to be, can you say something in Swedish? Oh, I wish I could right now, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> Fair enough. Putting you on the spot. You got to hit up hard. Duolingo again. No, I might have to. Google Translate. That's what I lived off of when I was in Czech and all over. So, When you were over there, did you still have your usual number, number nine? The teams always had a certain amount of numbers they had. It was, you know, some teams were one through 30, and you only had a certain number to pick from since I was an import. I came later on in the season. 
So, no, it changed up every year, which is kind of tough for me, but it's part of the game. I was going to say, because that's a big part of your identity now. You're a Gordy, yeah. and you're wearing number nine. It's, you it's, set a high bar for yourself. I know, I know. That's tough, but, hey, it comes with the role. <laughs> <laughs> Was Gordy Howe always someone that you idolized growing up, even without the name? Or? Yeah, I mean, of course. Yeah, I mean, my dad loved him growing up, so I'd always see stuff with him, and you know, it just became a habit. And then next thing you know, I'm wearing the same number. There was no temptation to switch to eight because of Alex Ovechkin. No, as much as I am a Cast fan, I couldn't do that's that's too much pressure right there. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Now, you come in here with a sort of a different style. I mean, you still have the beard, but it's not quite not as, as long, long as it was not, last season. Not yet, but it's, it's it's getting on the roll now. I was I mean, going to say. Back in Danbury, might as well, nothing else. You know? <laughs> yeah, I was talking to Shinksy uh, in our last episode, and I was getting on him for trimming the locks that he used yeah, to have oh back yeah. in the day. He had, he had a good flow going on. He did. Now, he's not growing his out. I would imagine you and Bronner are going to have a nice little competition between yourselves as oh, to who's oh, going to have the longer beard. Oh, of course we will, of course we will. That's, you know, that's part of the game. We love it, too. In your unbiased opinion, who's better? I mean, I'd say Bronner's, of course. I mean, <laughs> what an unselfish can't, teammate. Yeah, you can't compete with that, but hey. <laughs> I'm going to try to go for the title, but you know. You never did the handlebars? No, never came to that. I don't know. I just like the beard look, you know. It's, maybe I'll get put in pressure this season. Who knows? We'll, we'll see what comes. <laughs> hey, it's COVID time. You <laughs> experiment, right? There's yeah. no time like now. Exactly. <laughs> Now, when you're playing, when you're hot, you're hot. You got on a really good point streak last year, a couple of them, really. What are you most excited about this team that Anthony Bowen has really assembled for you guys? Personally, and, you know, guys I've talked to, we're going to be one of the top teams in this league, no doubt. I mean, we have a lot of returners coming in, solid guys, and then we're bringing in even the same amount of, same playing caliber guys in. So I'm excited, you know, the next couple weeks guys start rolling in and we'll get rolling and we'll get the chemistry back and game on from there. When, when that puck drops, what kind of energy do you anticipate? Are you going to be nervous at all? Or are you going to, are you going to remember how to play? <laughs> oh, I'm definitely going to remember how to play. And there's, I'm, nerves, I mean, that's, you know, it comes with the game sometimes it is. But, you know, it makes me work harder. It makes me focus in a lot easier. So I'll be, I'll be in the zone ready to go when the puck is here. Now, is there anything that you would like to say to our Danbury Hattrick fans who have been waiting so eagerly to cheer you guys on again. I just, just want to be simple. I mean, stay with us. We are doing what we can to make this season happen. I mean, we're here now. We're making an effort. We're making a push. And, you know, just please stay with us. That's as simple as it gets. We love you guys, and, you know, hopefully we can fill this place out really soon. Well, I don't think staying with you guys is going to be much of a problem. This no. is a diehard fan base, and they can't wait to oh, see I, you guys I again. Live, I live for coming to these games. I mean, it's home games are the best games in the, out of the whole season anything you know everywhere i played europe you can't beat this crowd <laughs> no there's no one that compares to it now you usually have family in the crowd too right it's your mom is usually in section yeah. 102 is it oh yeah mom and dad usually make it up as much as they can but hey they're they're all, they're in it they're all for it <laughs> they better be in it if they're sitting in 102 <laughs> i say so hey they, <laughs> they still keep in touch with them on facebook and everything so it's funny to see the conversations they have and you know, everything that goes with that. Well, hey, Mama Bunnell, we can't wait to have you <laughs> back in our stands here in Danbury Arena. Gordy, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us, and we can't wait to see you back out on I the ice again. It. Thanks for having me out. The Hat City Hockey Show is presented by the Danbury Hat Tricks. Follow at Danbury Hat Tricks on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and subscribe to YouTube.com slash Danbury Hat Tricks. My next guest on the Hat City Hockey Show is a DC sports legend. He has won Emmys, a Board of Governors award, and he is about to start his 27th season as the voice of the Washington Capitals on NBC Sports Washington. Please welcome Joe Beninati. Joe. What's the name of the team again? The Danbury Hat Tricks. So we have a team in the Federal Prospects Hockey League and in the North American Hockey League. Tough, roughest, toughest team in the Federal League. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you are familiar with Slapshot fame, that makes fun. That's funny. I like it. So the first thing I always like to ask people, Joe, is what they've been watching, reading, listening to that has sort of kept them sane through this whole process. At the beginning, Casey, it was swinging a golf club. Honestly, that was the only thing that was getting my mind off of not working at the at the best times. Normally, with um, you know, when you go into the summer months, obviously there is some downtime. But this was such an abnormal 2020 in the way we were, you know, your time shifted. So the, the Caps were playing in a first round playoff loss in the bubble in August, which was mind bogglingly weird to begin with. And then uh, you had the four months or so layoff and 
Um, I do like to play golf. There were times when I could play too much. And all of a sudden now, oh boy, the aches and pains of someone in their mid fifties that, you know, normally when you're in your mid twenties, that's no problem. Let's go play 36 holes. Can't do that anymore. Had to take a little break from it, dial it back down. And um, I was grateful. Big 10 Network gave me um, an opportunity to do, I think it was three, uh, three conference football games. It's the only thing that's really kept my beak wet in the last uh, five or six months. So there's some of that anxiety approaching an NHL season about, uh, you know, will your play-by-play chops be right? Uh, thankfully, with those three broadcasts, those three football games, uh, I think I'm in a good place. I can't actually believe that we're ramping up to a, to the start of the new season. I'm looking forward to it. And just like you, you're, you're trying to be as optimistic as possible and crossing your fingers that everybody's going to be able to do this smoothly and, and safely. The football world certainly tried to keep you on your toes in your broadcasting chops because you had that crazy lateral play in Rutgers this year. So they're just trying to make story, sure that you're on your toes. Story of my life, Casey. That was almost, that was this close to being immortal, right? That's the story <laughs> of my life. This close to immortality. That play would live forever. Uh, I'm sure people will show it, but if it actually had stood, uh, it'd be an amazing thing. I can't believe they actually had the gall to overturn it. I mean, we're talking about a whisker, an inch or two. And the, and the young man who made the play, Shameen Jones, the one that was actually flagged for, for the forward lateral, it, it was an amazing effort just to continue the play. The poor guy was in tears when they called it back. So was I and uh, uh, Matt Millen in the booth. <laughs> there are no whistles. There are no flags. Joe, uh, you are a Long Islander. Uh, one of my best friends from college is a St. Anthony's Friar. Uh, you know, I've, I've called games out in the rinks in Hot Bog as well. Uh, and I love a story that you told about your upbringing out there, uh, about sneaking out of your bedroom to uh, take a peek at Ranger games that your dad was watching at night. Because I did the exact same thing when I was a kid and it was past my bedtime. Do you remember the first game that you saw at MSG? And they're probably not there anymore, but do you remember where the seats were? Well, my, it's one, another one of my favorite stories, too. My dad was a New York City firefighter. My father passed away, gosh, almost 18 years now uh, this month. It, it feels like 180 years since I actually talked with him. But my father was a New York City firefighter. He and three buddies had season tickets to Ranger games at Madison Square Garden. So as an 8, 9, 10, 11-year-old kid, I was going with dad hand-in-hand hand to the garden to watch games and um, these were the days of the Blyer bullies and the big bad Bruins and all. And I'll never forget those days. Fast forward to the time when you've become a professional announcer and you're actually going back into Nassau Coliseum or Madison Square Garden like you did when you were a kid. But now you're a professional and you're working the game there. That's always been something that I look forward to. The first time after Madison Square Garden was sort of retrofit, I went to go and look where those seats were where my dad's season tickets were in the new configuration of the building. They don't exist, Casey. Those seats are no longer there, which makes it even more of, I think, of a cool story to tell. But um, I often walk into that building and this cascade of memories comes back. I often do go back thinking about when I was uh, nine or 10 years old. Again, my dad was a firefighter. He lived his his house, his firehouse, fire station was right around the corner from this incredible Italian deli. And I'll never forget, again, walking in there as a little guy. And every, we, we, at, this was a time when you could bring food into Madison Square Garden. Oh, the good old days. <laughs> so, so dad would walk us down to the deli. We'd have these incredible sandwiches to walk into the arena with. But uh, I'll never forget the, the woman behind the counter making the sandwich. Basically, every third slice, she handed over the counter to me. <laughs> so I was full by the time I left the deli. We had this sandwich that was this big still to eat. But um, some of the best memories of my life, Casey. Some of my best, best, fondest memories. The old garden. It's funny that you mentioned that the seats are not there anymore. My dad proposed oh. to my mom at Madison Square Garden. Hello. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, New Year's Eve 1987. Uh, when the Rangers were playing the Nordiques and they and they were sitting in the yellow seats, which again, don't exist anymore. No, nope. the third level. With the way the building has been retrofit, with the way they have redone the press box, it's now one of my favorite broadcast locations to work from. We're not gonna be doing that this year. We're gonna be calling those games from Bethesda when the Caps are on the road. But again, I, I'm happy that we're 
we're just uh, we're running an NHL business the way uh, the best way they can possibly run it nowadays. Now, I'm always fascinated by how guys get their start in the industry, uh, be it Brett Dolan living in the locker room in Beloit or, or Brendan Burke getting reps with Arena Football 2 uh, in Peoria just to keep his beak wet, as you said. Your path is equally as unconventional because you made the bold decision to you know, look your parents in the eye and say, Ma, put that Harvard Med application down. I'm working in sports. Uh, if I were to pop a microbiology quiz on your desk, how do you think you would do? F. <laughs> Failure. <laughs> at, 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 Bowdoin College, at, at Bowdoin College, the grades were high honors, honors, pass, fail. If you put that microbiology exam in front of me now, I'm not going to do so well at it. No, sorry, not going to do so well on it. Uh, you mean, come on, most sports mo most sportscasters didn't want to grow up being a surgeon? Uh, that's <laughs> that's just the way it was. I, I And it, it was genuine. I'm not making that up. When I was 14, 15, I loved sports. I always loved it. But I wanted to be a surgeon. I wanted to be a, an orthopedic surgeon to help, uh, you know, repair arms and elbows and shoulders and knees of, of athletes. And, and then all of a sudden I went to school and things changed and somebody put a microphone in front of my face and I started to call games like I was a youngster doing street hockey games when I was 10. And it, it all clicked. And um, I will, it's hard not to forget that phone call, my, probably my sophomore year to mom and dad. And, you know, I really don't know about med school. Um, and they were like, oh my goodness, because we're, we're, we're at one of the finest colleges in the country and it was all going to be, yeah, Bowdoin to Harvard and the rest was history and it didn't turn out that way. We were spending a lot of money <laughs> and uh, there was no communications major. There was no broadcast journalism major, not at the time. I, I could go back and check to be sure, but I'm pretty sure there, that wasn't an offering at the time. You know, Bowdoin makes doctors and lawyers and um, puts out tremendous... Um, candidates for other jobs but not necessarily sportscasters and uh it turned out to be okay um i got some really great breaks along the way i set some goals for myself pretty early in life and thankfully i achieved them and um all of a sudden to get a national hockey league opportunity at age 28 an american hockey league opportunity at 24 things you know fell in line and fit properly and uh we've done pretty well since but i'm not finished improving i, I want to get better and better so if you're a med student, does it ever uh, cross your mind that, you know, Mike Emmerich is called Doc famously, but you, you're the med student here. Shouldn't, shouldn't that monitor? No, no, no. I just have, all I have is a biology degree. I, I, I have no doctorate. And I, like I said, by the time I was into my junior and senior year in college, I was working in the sports information department. I was being groomed as the future SID. The day I graduated, basically, I walked across the, the stage and moved the tassel and they gave me the SID job. So the, the wonderful thing was I never had to look for employment. It was already guaranteed. And, um, sports was gonna be the way I was gonna make my living. And mom and dad were holding their breath at home and, and praying that things are gonna turn out right. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I can laugh about it now, but Back then, I, I was certain. I, I, I made the decision with a lot of conviction. Uh, I don't think I was guessing. Uh, people were saying good things about my work as a, as a teenager. I did my first game on TV, Casey, when I was 18. So people were saying some good things that there seemed to be a natural ability there. And thankfully, we've taken it uh, a pretty far way. And your first pro gig in hockey was with the Maine Mariners, which was mm -hmm. not long after Mike Emmerich was there. And you tweeted a little while ago that your boss made it clear that he was the bar and, and your lifeline. I know he wasn't Doc yet, but, but that's a heck of a standard uh, to live up to. When you first got to know Doc, uh, what do you think he helped you with the most in your first AHL job? It's interesting. You mentioned the main Mariners, Mike Emmerich, and Dale Arnold, who for a long time did the Boston Bruins and is still involved in the New England area, still does, if I'm not mistaken, pre and post for the, for the Bruins. Dale was a Bowden grad too. So if there was a time there, there were two Bowden guys calling NHL play by play. Doc, the first time I, um, first time I ever communicated with him, I still have the letter. He and Gary Thorne, uh, Gary was working at the University of Maine and in Portland, Maine at the time doing double A baseball. And those are the two guys who really helped to groom me, mentor me, who took the time to constructively criticize my work and my tapes and I'm forever grateful to them. Two pretty good ones to, to uh, take, to have taken under your wing. Mike was always, um, 
super critical and and listening with an extremely careful eye uh, with a careful ear and watching with a careful eye what you were doing and what you were sending to him whether it be an audio tape or something that you might have done at that time for me it was on Nesson uh, when I was given the opportunity to call the American League games on tape on TV all the communications were to help me get better never once did he say do it like me he didn't say that but my boss with the main Mariners the president of the team the owner of the club uh, held Mike in such high regard that you know he he wasn't talking about broadcasting per se he was talking about all the prep work all the interpersonal skills the way Mike interacted with players and coaches and fans that was that was the model you know you don't do it just like Doc don't take his cadence don't take his try and take his rhyme do it and be yourself but behave like him it was always a, a handshake with a smile a pleasant greeting and a guy who you just could sit and talk hockey with or sports with or life with for umpteen minutes and never be bored. I like that you touched on uh, Gary Thorne as well, because I, I know that he was one of your resources in coming up. And Gary Thorne was my come to Jesus moment when I knew I kind of wanted to be a broadcaster. Because when, when I was eight going on nine years old, it was the 2004 Stanley Cup final. And I stayed up late so I could watch game seven. And that was like the first hockey game I, I vividly remember sitting down and watching. And when Gary Thorne called like Ruslan Fedotenko's second goal of that game, I, it's still vividly imprinted into my mind. He's got another one, Fedotenko! Just the way he said it and his cadence. Uh, brings it in himself, left it in the middle, shot, score! He's got another one, Fedotenko! That was when I really knew I wanted to be a student of broadcasting, which led me to Doc Emmerich and to the late Dave Strader and to you and to Sam Rosen. Did you ever have like a, like a, uh, a seminal moment like that where, where you heard someone and, and knew this is what you wanted to do? It is true that when we were kids playing pickup basketball and touch football and street hockey, I was the dumb dumb who had all the names in his head and would call the games while we were playing. And we'd get off the bus for school that day and we'd run home and, hey, Joe, we're going to be the 76ers and the Celtics when we play basketball. I got all the names together and I called the game. And we got the Nets out for street hockey. We're going, we want to be the Blues and the Blackhawks today. And Dum Dum had all the names. I guess that's when the seed was implanted. I really wasn't sure that I could do it professionally at the level required until I had the chance to do my first pro game in the American Hockey League. I filled in for a friend who was, who was missing that day. And that was, I was at the time, I was in Brunswick, Maine as the sports information director for Bowdoin. My friend was working, my friend Scott Wyckoff was working as the voice of the Maine Mariners. He invited me, he, he needed to fill it. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm on the bus six hours up to Sherbrooke, Quebec with a bunch of young kids who were trying to make the NHL. And I did that first pro game on my own and the reviews were good, really good. And that's where I was like, you know what? Maybe this could work. Maybe the game wouldn't be too fast for me to, to a appropriately describe. I still have those tapes. I listen to those tapes. The voice is different. It's much younger. Um, but the, the call that was there that day has changed to a degree some 30 years later. But the foundation was there. And I knew that, you know what, if you work at this properly, if you do take those lessons and that mentorship and listen and learn from those who've been there before you, you can do this. People were saying that, you know, this isn't a fluke. You, you have some ability. And if they had shot me down then, Casey, it would have been on to something else. But there was encouragement there and there was opportunity there. So I got that main job shortly thereafter. And now you're able to get the reps, the repetition needed to advance in the career. And that's really what it is. You have to, if you're going to be a 90% free throw shooter in basketball, what do you do? You practice. If you're going to be a professional level, network level announcer, what do you do? You have to practice some way. And all of a sudden, instead of making believe, you know, muting the TV and making believe I was doing games, now I had the chance to call 80 some games in a regular season and get that repetition and build up the strength and the voice to do it the right way and knock on wood it turned out fine <laughs> i'd say so i'd say so getting to your time in dc 
Uh, you've been there for, for over 25 years now. You're an integral part of the landscape and you've seen it all and you've seen a lot of great players come through the Capitals organization. So I want to touch on your skills as a goalie because I know you were a goalie in hockey and lacrosse. If you're in a shootout and you're sitting in the crease mm -hmm. and there is a Washington Capitals, from any point. Today, Casey, today or when I was 17? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you're in your prime. You're in your prime. You're, you're okay. Prime. My, athletic, my athletic prime. Okay. <laughs> you're, in, you're in peak physical condition, and there's a Washington Capitol standing at the red line ready to shoot on you. Who would you be most intimidated, or who would you most want to face in a shootout like that? First of all, honestly, I'm not stopping that player. If he, if he wants to score – if he's properly incentivized to score, Casey, um, that player is going to score. People, I, I love this. This is, this is a, a scenario that I often paint. And I know they had, did they have this show? I think it was called Pros versus Joes. Pros versus Joes, yeah. I mean, the lot of us wants to think that, okay, in my athletic prime as a goalie, and I, I was okay, pretty good, and yeah, all right, I was, I was pretty good. Um, you're not stopping Alex Ovechkin if Alex Ovechkin doesn't want you to stop him. You you have no idea. We as people who wanted who wanted to be NHL goalies, yes, that was me, sure. No. You don't know how good those guys are that stop Alex 85% of the time. It's incredible. When I first came to the team, Peter Bondra, who was the previous goal scoring champion for the Caps, Peter Bondra, I would get on the ice and I'd take slap shots from Peter Bondra. And at 50% of his slap shot, it was almost overwhelming. He took care not to give me the full 100% treatment, although the competitor in me at that time would have been, what, I would have been close to 30. Not my athletic goaltending prime, but still, at that age, I'm like, I can stop you, let's go. And he would blow it by me at 50%, 60%. So imagine if I got the full NHL treatment. No, 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 no. You, the competitor inside of you says, yeah, sure, I can, in lacrosse, I can stop Paul Rabel. And then you watch Paul Rabel lifting the lacrosse goal off the field with the strength of his shot. No, you don't want any part of that, sir. You don't. Even though there's that burning, oh, I can make that save. He's not that baloney. He's not that good. You watch them, and the ball is literally hissing on the way to the lacrosse net. The puck, it turns into a, a, a dot on the way to the cage. When Alex Ovechkin shoots it, you see it leave his stick, and then it's like, no, it's like it's a blur. It, it, you don't want any of that. No, 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 no chance. If if you give them 10 shots from a certain location and you say, bury them all against an average Joe, they're going to bury them all, unless they hit you by accident. And they're pretty good, and they don't have to hit you by accident. Fair enough. Positioning is key, so yeah, you could luck into it. Well, I'll, I'll do my best to be in the right spot, and it, it, it'll be a fascinating challenge. And like I said, in my mind, I can make this save. No problem. I can... No. Do you have a favorite piece of memorabilia from your career, be it from just in the broadcast booths or from your Stanley Cup parade? This is a funny story. The Caps win the Cup in June of 2018. And people are familiar with the way they were running the city streets and sharing the occasion with the with the fans in this area. And it, those are some of the days and nights that I'll never, ever forget. Fabulous stuff. And we could talk forever about different stories there, but there was one, you talk about memorabilia. There was one, there was one that makes me laugh. Um, June happens, parade happens, rally happens. Summertime comes up and it's a short summer because the caps went so far and you're, you're okay with that. And it's probably Casey's probably almost mid August. And there's a phone message on my machine, and I push the button. Joe, hi, it's Dick Patrick with the Washington Capitals. Can you please give me a call when you have a moment? Now, Dick Patrick, he's the president of the club. Uh, he's not often on my answering machine. I know him well, and it's always a great experience to speak with him and see him and shake his hand. But he's not often giving me phone calls in the you know tail end of summer. I heard the message, and I started to shake a little. And I'm like okay, am I in trouble here? Is there something bad going down? Uh, have I been gassed? Am I, am I, what happened? I, I get on the phone and I call Mr. Patrick's office and Dick Patrick gets on and goes, Joe, uh, thanks for getting back to me. I just want to let you and Craig Lachlan know that you guys are going to get the actual team ring. 
you're getting the real Stanley Cup championship ring. We we, we think so highly of you, et cetera, et cetera. All this great, all these great things that he said. And I was so overjoyed and hung up the phone, relieved that I, <laughs> that I wasn't fired uh, and thrilled that I was going to be getting a, a true version of the Stanley Cup ring down the line. And, and we had this ceremony and it was, it was terrific. Um, I do from time to time open the drawer and peek in there to make sure that ring is still there and that it's legit. Those are experiences you'll never, ever forget. And I, I've mentioned this, that um, you, you get into this business, we're all competitors. Um, you want to call the biggest moments. And that night of June 7th in 2018 is forever burned in my memory for a lot of reasons. One is, is a tough one because you didn't get a chance to call that game. Uh, as TV announcers, you know this at the NHL level, the, the local rights holders get one round of the playoffs. They're bumped off uh, for rounds two, three, and four. I was there at T-Mobile that night. I was there when the Stanley Cup was wheeled out with four minutes to go in regulation right in front of me and being polished up. And it was one of the happiest moments in my life and one of the most conflicted because I was thrilled over the moon for the players and the fans and the ownership and everybody who's involved with the team that they're finally going to do it. But there's part of me that was going, oh my gosh, what would it have been like to put an NBC Sports Washington spin to these last few minutes, these final seconds? What would Craig and uh, Alan May and Al Koken, what, what would we have said? How would we have tied it together? What would we, and it was just eating away at me and it, and it still will for a long, long time. It's one of those incredible roller coaster nights. Um, it, that's a tough one in our, in our business. It's a tough one. I completely empathize with that because I, I really understand where you're going. You're coming from. Uh, I will say it's at the very least at the end of it, the ring is awesome. And you got to cruise in a red Ferrari with locker and, and MC the parade. I mean, that's, that's not too shabby a consolation prize as they yeah. call it. <laughs> John Walton and I had a great time hosting the, the rally afterwards. Uh, locker was tremendous to go, to go through the, uh, the city streets with him, um, just the the amount of joy and laughter uh, coming from him normally is amazing. But um, you know, tenfold during a Stanley Cup championship parade, you know, here's a guy who who competed for the cup and wore that sweater uh, proudly, and and they never were able to advance far enough for for him to enjoy the the, the spoils of a champion as as a player. The team was made sure to include Craig and Alan May, another former cap, part of our broadcast team, our telecast team. The team made sure to wrap its arms around those two guys and say, hey, you know, you're a big part of this. And I know those two guys especially uh, will be forever appreciative of what the team did for them. Uh, it's an organizational thing. It's an organizational triumph. And for Washington, I know they're hoping desperately to get back to another one. I know Alex Ovechkin in particular and all the all the players who were there that uh, on that night who were part of that team, they want to do it again. Once you get the taste for it, you want it again. There's a lot to prepare for in the upcoming season, and by the time that this airs, the, the puck will have dropped on, on the 2021 campaign, so there's a lot to look forward to, in particular in one department. Uh, being from New York, uh, when we think of style, we think of Clyde Frazier and the elaborate suits that he has <laughs> next to Mike Green. But the Joe Beninati drip cannot be slept on because Joe B suit of the day is a hashtag that is makes the rounds on Capitals game day. I want to share my screen with my favorite one here. Uh, this was this was one of your looks on NBC, the white suit with the red tie. That's clean right there. That's okay, so now look. listen listen to me. Listen to me. This is this is the beauty of lighting okay <laughs> that jacket honestly it is not white it's a light light gray the pinstriping in there casey is actually cream oh you're right the pants that day are cream but if you and i were in person if you saw that jacket in person it's actually a light gray almost light blue and the lighting the lamps at nbc sports washington make it look so mm -hmm. bright white like that um it's funny you're you're the second person who's mentioned it and it does, it will give that white look. Obviously, I'm not arguing with you. That's, that's white on the screen right now. But in real life, you'd see it. It's, it's light gray, light blue, and the pinstriping is cream. <laughs> it's, it looks like that, that dress that made the rounds where people are arguing over ah, white, white and gold yes, and yes. blue and black. <laughs> very, very good. Uh, I've had, I've had uh, a love affair with uh, <clears throat> men's clothing since I was, what, uh, 
oh gosh, maybe 17, 18. And when I was in the American Hockey League in Maine, I actually was working in a men's clothing store. That's really where the seed was planted. I was moonlighting on the weekends to make a little extra cash. <laughs> and the, 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 by the way, the store was uh, Joseph's in Portland, Maine. So it had the right name, which was terrific. And the, the owner there at the time, he, he, he liked my eye for, for putting things together. He let me put looks together for different clients as they would come in and they'd walk in and I would have already laid out three or five, three or four or five different suit outfit looks and they'd go, no, yes, yes, yes. And it, it was a good experience, but I've always been hooked on clothing for a long, long time. And sometimes we get it right. That one's beautiful for the people don't get this. People don't often get to see my, my summer wardrobe like that. I, you know, normally I'm working in the winter and fall. But that one, that one has made the rounds, and it's actually not really white. It's funny. Wow. It's a good look, though. We, our <laughs> colors are black and orange in Danbury, so I'll ask here, uh, how would you rate the fit look for uh, the booth? We have matching orange ties and orange pocket squares, courtesy of our ownership group. That's my color commentator, Zach and Jack, there. Uh, what, what do you think? How would you rate the fit? I love it. I think it's great. Um, I would... If I were you wearing the vest like that, is this on TV or is this uh, is this a stream? It's a, it's a web stream on YouTube. Yes. So see, see like underneath the vest, mm -hmm. just make sure in those instances, tuck the, tuck the point of the tie into your pants. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, can, you can only see from the waist down. It's kind of like, yeah, a yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, so yeah. I think, I think you, that's three well-dressed guys right there. <laughs> All right. Awesome. I'm putting that in my LinkedIn bio from now. Three well-dressed guys. <laughs> uh, well, well, Joe, thank you so much. I'll let you go. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time here uh, on the show. We, we can't wait to hear you again in the booth. Uh, we're so happy that NHL season is back and hope uh, that you have good times and good health in 2021. Same to you and your family, Casey. Thanks for inviting me. It's always uh, uh, great to talk about hockey. And now that we can get into it, I just continue to pray that all of us stay safe and healthy and uh, we have a great season ahead. Couldn't have said it better. Thanks so much, Joe. That'll do it for us here on the Hat City Hockey Show. If you like that episode, be sure to click like and subscribe for future episodes and be sure to follow us at Danbury Hattricks on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm Casey Bryant. Take care.